Hi, biochemists. We're going to talk about the digestion of polysaccharides, fats, and a little bit about the digestion of nucleic acids now. Um, we're going to mention a little bit about why cells need to use enzymes. Um, we're going to talk about the different classes of enzymes. In this case, we're focusing on fats, starches, and uh, nucleotides, nucleo, nucleic acids, rather. Uh, and we're going to think about uh, the path that glucose or other sugars would take um, to get from inside your stomach and then into cells and into the blood to be useful uh, for our body for metabolism. We're going to talk about the, the path that triglycerides or other fats take, um, which is similar, but requires different digestive enzymes. So we've got this uh, cartoon of a person eating some pizza here. Um, you can see as the pizza is chewed up in the mouth, that's the beginning of digestion. And remember, we've got some salivary amylase that's here inside the mouth, helping to start breakdown of carbohydrates here. You remember that, of course, because we did it, we talked about it in lab. Then the food passes into the stomach here, and we've got um, for carbohydrates, fats and nucleic acids, it's really going to be the churning activity and the low pH of the stomach that starts some of this breakdown. Um, and then once uh, sugars, fats, and nucleic acids get into the small intestine, um, enzymes from the pancreas are really going to come into play to break down those food products into small monomers that our cells can take up and use for metabolism. The, uh, as we move through from the esophagus into the stomach, you can see we've got the salivary amylase that I mentioned. In the stomach, there are proteases, including pepsin, but we're not talking about prote proteins in this video. Instead, we're talking about fats, sugars, nucleic acids. Um, so for those biomolecules, really the stomach acid, along with the churning, is gonna be the primary role that the stomach plays in digestion. And then the liver releases and stores bile salts in the gallbladder. This helps with emulsification of lipids, lipids. So that's going to be important. And then there are a number of really important enzymes that are released from the pancreas to help us dig digest fats, sugars, and nucleic acids. Uh, this includes amylase, lipase, nuclease, and of course, bicarbonate ions that help uh, neutralize all of the acid that comes from the stomach as well. Last but not least, we are going to talk about some of these membrane bound enzymes that help the monomers uh, get from the inside of the intestine into our cells so we can use those monomers for um, metabolism for energy. So here's a cartoon of our stomach. Um, we've got food that comes in from our mouth. Um, once inside the stomach, proteins can be broken down by the enzyme pepsin. And these short proteins or oligopeptides can help activate uh, an, or the release of a hormone from the small intestine called cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin will stimulate the gallbladder to release some of these bile salts. And cholecystokinin also stimulates the pancreas to release digestive enzymes. Uh, you'll note as well that initial digestion products other than peptides, including and additional to peptides, um, like breakdown products of fat or breakdown products of sugars, um, due to the churning and mushing and low pH environment of the stomach, these initial digestion products can also help stimulate the hormone secretin from the small intestine. Secretin uh, cues the pancreas to release bicarbonate to neutralize that stomach acid as it travels here into the small intestine. So since we're caring about carbohydrate digestion, um, proteases are released from the pancreas, but we actually don't care about those. Um, the ones we'll focus on right now, since we're thinking about carbohydrates, are amylases. So amylases released from the pancreas. 
So here at the top, we have um, a polysaccharide, uh, a starch molecule, and alpha amylase acts on this starch molecule. In fact, this starch molecule here would be the substrate for the alpha amylase enzyme. And as amylase acts on the, uh, the starch, it's going to break it down into smaller molecules, um, into groups of one or two or three glucose molecules. Remember, because we're going from a uh, large polymer to smaller molecules, uh, this is going to be an example of a catabolic reaction. That is, we're cutting. It's a catabolic reaction. And since it's catabolic, it's going to be exergonic. We've got a molecule with lots of energy stored in the bonds up here, and we're going to be releasing some energy, delta G less than zero, as we break down into these smaller uh, digestion products. So alpha amylase is the first step in breaking down these long chains of glucose. But you can see here, we don't have uh, very many single glucose molecules. So instead there are additional enzymes that are important for breaking down these like trimers, like maltotriose. Alpha glucosidase can break that down. Um, maltose uh, requires maltase to break it down into single glucose molecules. And uh, this uh, molecule where the starch branches uh, is called an alpha limit dextrin. And because it has this one six uh, glycosidic bond in it. So it requires a special enzyme alpha dextrinase to um, break that one six bond. All of these enzymes working together, amylase and its friends are gonna help produce glucose. That is break down all of this starch into single glucose molecules. Awesome, carbohydrate digestion. So let's think about fat digestion now. We're back at the stomach again. Food is coming in, churn, churn, churn. Digestive enzymes are being released by the pancreas. Proteases are released, but we don't care. Amylases are released, but we don't care. Because we're focusing on fats here, we want to focus on lipases, that is enzymes that will break down lipids, and bile salts. So let's talk about how those work. So we'll walk through this together. Here's a fat droplet um, or a glob of fat that comes in off of your pizza. Uh, and inside the stomach, there may be some lipase, something that's gonna break down fats, um, gastric lipase or stomach lipase present at a, at a kind of low level. Um, so this gastric lipase is gonna hang out on the surface of this fat droplet and start breaking down fats from the inside in, from the outside in rather. Why are fats uh, forming these droplets inside the stomach? How come they're not, you know, just chains or small globs? Well, remember that the stomach, like so much of life, is an aqueous environment. That is, it's filled with water, it's very polar. Fats as you know, are very nonpolar. And so fats are gonna like to stick together in globs. Uh, and that's why the gastric lipase has to start from the outside and just sort of chew inward, um, encountering more and more lipid as a substrate as it goes along. So the gastric lipase combined with the churning motion of the stomach is gonna break these large fat globules down into smaller fat globules. Once these move into the pancreas, um, there's a lot more lipase present. Uh, I'm sorry, once these move into the small intestine or the duodenum, there's a lot more lipase that comes from the pancreas, uh, as well as a co-lipase uh, that helps the pancreatic lipase to do its job. You can see we've got a lot more breakdown products here. These, these little uh, one-headed guys are uh, fatty acids. We've got uh, diacylglycerides here. Um, and we're kind of assuming that everything yellow is a triacylglyceride. 
So as lipase and colipase do their jobs, um, we're gonna break these fats down into uh, single fatty acids. Um, these still will likely glob together because remember that fatty acids are also still nonpolar. They're still gonna be globbing together, but they're in much smaller blobs, um, often called a micelle. Um, a micelle is almost like a, a single layer of the lipid bilayer. So rather than having two layers, we've just got one layer and it's forming like a circle, like a globe, a sphere. Um, so here's our little micelle sphere of uh, nonpolar molecules. And this can get absorbed ultimately by the cells in our small intestine so that we can use those fats inside our body. So let's talk more about um, what's happening uh, in the cells of the small intestine. So through the middle here is where breakdown products from the stomach are gonna be traveling. But the small intestine is also coated with these little finger-like projections called villi. And you can see the villi are actually made up of many, 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 many cells. So each one of these kind of little rectangles is one cell. Um, so many cells, um, epidermal cells, actually similar to your skin cells. Uh, these are epidermal cells. And then inside the little projection of the epidermal cell, we've got uh, blood vessels, a capillary network, as well as lymph vessels here. And on these epithelial cells, um, we have uh, a number of membrane-associated uh, enzymes. So things like peptidase, maltase, sucrase, and lactase. Um, so these bottom three here are going to break down uh, disaccharides into monosaccharides so that the monosaccharides can be brought inside the cell. Similarly, peptidases can break down um, tripeptides or dipeptides into single amino acids so they can be brought inside the cell. So what does it look like uh, for these monomers to be brought inside the epithelial cells that are lining our small intestine. So on the left here, we've got the intestinal lumen. That is uh, where all of our digestion products are traveling through. And then on the right, uh, and then we've got an epithelial cell, which on the right-hand side um, is near to blood vessels or to capillaries so that the monomers that are present inside the intestine can move through the epithelial cells and into the blood so that these useful molecules can travel to other cells inside the body. Uh, note also that there's only one way into the blood. You can't go between cells because there are tight junctions preventing anything from getting from the intestines into the blood unless um, that substance moves through the epithelial cell itself. So let's look at some of these membrane associated enzymes. So first, if we're considering fatty acids and monoacylglycerides, uh, we have a fatty acid binding protein that can help bring the fatty acids or monoacylglycerides inside the epithelial cell. We've also got um, some fatty acid transport proteins that can bring triacylglycerols inside the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum actually is an organelle where uh, lipids are made inside our cells. So you can see we've got phospholipids and cholesterol, as well as some nonpolar lipid associated proteins. Uh, all of these things can come together to form chylomicrons. Uh, and chylomicrons are transported out of epithelial cells, endothelial cells, into um, the lymph system. They don't necessarily travel directly through the blood. We are going to talk about later in the semester how cholesterol can be moved uh, through the blood with the help of cholesterol binding proteins. Um, but here we're really talking about uh, moving digestive breakdown products um, through the lymph system. That's, that's what's happening here. All right, let's shift 
And let's talk about amino acids and dye or tripeptides. So if we have a, a peptide, a short peptide, that's not yet a single amino acid. So an oligopeptide, like a dipeptide or tripeptide can be broken down by peptidase. This is a membrane associated enzyme. And then uh, amino acids all by themselves can be transported inside our cells using transporters. And there are also some di and tripeptide transporters as well. So uh, we need to get this protein or these proteins broken down into pretty small components, one or two amino acids in order to get them inside the cell. Once inside the cell, uh, amino acids and di and tripeptides can be moved into the blood thanks to a, an antiporter, a sodium amino acid antiporter that's on the inside wall of these epithelial cells. So we've talked about uh, symporters, thinking about glucose transport. This is an antiporter moving an amino acid out when we move a sodium in. And so these will move out into the blood. And then last but not least, uh, let's think about um, glucose, galactose, and fructose. There are uh, a number of transporters that can help move monosaccharides across the membrane. You can see here GLUT5 is a fructose specific transport protein. We've got also got SGLTs that can help move uh, six membered rings like glucose and galactose inside epithelial cells. And then, uh, and as we've talked about before, often sodium helps bring in glucose or galactose um, through a co-transporter. So sodium comes in as well as the sugar that's coming with it. And then in order to move into the blood, um, there are transporters such as the GLUT2 channel, which will allow carbohydrates um, or saccharides, monosaccharides to move right into the blood. A lot of different proteins uh, present on the membrane, helping move fats, amino acids, and sugars into our bloodstream, into out of our intestines where we've started to break them down, and then into our body where we can do additional uh, breakdown and metabolism. Last but not least, I want to talk really quickly about nucleic acid digestion. Um, and your textbook doesn't really cover this at all. Uh, nucleases can be released from the pancreas. If we're talking about nucleic acid digestion, proteases are released by the pancreas. But they don't act on DNA or RNA. Amylase and lipase are released by the pancreas, but they don't act on DNA or RNA. The only enzymes released from the pancreas that are going to influence nucleic acid digestion are nucleases. So these are released from the pancreas into the small intestine, and they help break down uh, longer chains of DNA and RNA into um, oligonucleotides or singular nucleotides. And that's all we're going to talk about with uh, nucleases. I really would suggest in order to keep things straight in your head, making a table or a concept map um, or even an illustration to summarize the digestion of the different, uh, the four different biomolecules. Um, the idea of enzymes being released from the pancreas, it happens for all four of these types of biomolecules. Um, but where, uh, where is there additional digestion? How is fat breakdown distinct from carbohydrate breakdown? Um, what do proteins need that other uh, enzymes or other biomolecules don't use during digestion? And last but not least, think a little bit about some of the challenges of getting the monomers of these different biomolecules inside our epithelial cells so that we can then pass them through the blood to other cells within the body. Totally recommend making a table. Last but not least, I want to show you a couple of practice problems to think about. So the first one is thinking about why a person who would have a deficiency in trypsinogen 
have more digestive problems than a person who lacks other zymogens like chemotrypsin or procarboxypeptidase. Pause the video for a minute and think about why would trypsinogen deficiency lead to digestive difficulties? So if you recall, trypsinogen is uh, the zymogen that will help produce trypsin. But once trypsin is active, trypsin can actually activate the other protease zymogens. That is, trypsin can activate chemotrypsinogen into chemotrypsin. Um, trypsin can activate procarboxypeptidase into carboxypeptidase. So if we don't have trypsinogen, though we don't have any of the other uh, digestive, the protein digestive enzymes. Whereas if you had um, a deficiency in like proelastase, could be a problem, but you're also, you're still going to have trypsin, chemotrypsin, and pro uh, carboxypeptidase. Um, if you're, if you're missing trypsin, you're not going to be activating any of those other digestive enzymes. So that's a, that's a trouble. Okay. Next question. Steatorrhea is the presence of increased fat in your solid waste or feces. Which organ is least likely to be the cause of a patient's steatorrhea? So to answer this question, we need to think about what each of these organs provide to help your body break down fats. Take a minute, pause the video, and, and let's think about what could cause this increased fat. Well, we know that the stomach is important for mushing and churning, but if the stomach's not a mushing and churning, fat still could get broken down by enzymes. We definitely know that the pancreas is releasing lipases to break down fats. The small intestine is where the breakdown occurs using pancreatic lipases. Um, so it's probably not the small intestine. It's probably not the stomach. Um, and then the liver, hmm. The liver, if you'll recall, is where bile salts come from. And bile salts help emulsify the fats, helping to break them down um, into the more aqueous environment. So emulsification, the same way you have to mix, 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 mix to get oil and water um, to come together in a salad dressing, for example, that emulsification is aided by the bile salts released um, from the liver. So the best answer here is probably the pancreas because it releases lipase, but liver is also going to be a really important organ um, because it makes those bile salts to help um, sort of help the clumps of lipids break down into smaller pieces. Last but not least, a patient comes in with abdominal pain. Their lab results show that they have normal levels of pancreatic enzymes, normal levels of pepsinogen, and good motility or movement within the stomach and the gallbladder. But there is an acidic small intestine environment. Which hormone would you say is not in balance? Leptin, cholecystokinin, gastrin, and secretin. Take a second, pause the video. So we haven't really talked about leptin or gastrin at all. And these uh, hormones are both important for sensing hunger and satiation. Um, we did talk about cholecystokinin and secretin. And if you check back with your uh, cartoon of the stomach, it's secretin that actually stimulates the um, bicarbonate release from the pancreas. Um, cholecystokinin helps stimulate the release of digestive enzymes, and secretin helps stimulate the release of bicarbonate to neutralize the small intestine. So if we have an acidic small intestine, it's likely that secretin is not working and bicarbonate is not being released.
All right, so that's all I wanted us to think about um, with digestion. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, you guys.